Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session, 2 o'clock on Friday, session of um, the Ancient Greece Symposium, a futuristic look through ancient lenses. And uh, uh, you can go as far back as you like, and you find interesting things that are past, but in ancient Greece, you find things that are past and present and maybe future, depending on how you use them. Greek, it's all Greek to me, and maybe to many of us, as a language, wonder. You are for a surprise today. It is for today and tomorrow, maybe. It shapes our today and tomorrow, and I'm anxious to see how our distinguished speaker will tell us this. Uh, it's uh, very easy and very hard to uh, present your friend and your pastor. Um, he is uh, a moving encyclopedia with a sense of humor, if you'll know what I mean. Kay. You will get a taste of this right away. And um, he's never boring, to me at least, <laughs> and to the children at church, and to the men and women as well. I don't know how he does this, but I know mm -hmm. this is a gift from God. Yeah. And if I go to the list here, quote-unquote, of his qualification, his a professor of church history, uh, and uh, but meet the man. That's the best thing. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wafiq. Yes. I want to thank uh, Dr. Wabi for inviting me to participate in this. Most of your speakers and presenters have been resident here on campus, uh, perhaps all except for me. So I appreciate having the opportunity to be a part of the Eastern community and share with you this afternoon. Uh, thanks for being faithful to come out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, there may be many challenges that you could have uh, encountered or other things that could have been a part of your life this afternoon, but I'm grateful that you came to uh, participate with us. Uh, the first thing I think I'm going to tell you is I'm going to sit down, if that's okay. Uh, I'm going to do that. Yeah, oh, wow, nice chair. All right. I have not had an opportunity to visit with many of the presenters that have you've had in this symposium. I'm very delighted, though, that you have had this because it challenges us to be aware in this particular context of what the Greeks have meant to us even today in a variety of, of ways. Uh, I come out of a background of church history. Uh, I've taught at colleges and even one divinity school, and uh, now I'm enjoying the opportunity of uh, practicing some of that out in pastoral ministry. But uh, on this particular day, what I want to do is, is dare to move into the field of Greek language a little bit. I am not an expert on the Greek language. Uh, let's just say those times I've dealt with the Greek language in the past I tried to stay about five minutes ahead of my students whenever it came to that because of the various aspects of the language. But if you're here with a history background, I wanted to help us be refreshed a little bit and understanding or being here or hearing again some of the ways by which the Greek language has moved through history to have an impact today. In this symposium and this series of speakers, you have become more aware of the vast uh, impact of Greek culture, Greek life, Greek literature, Greek art, all of that upon the world. Uh, you may want to ask, though, why is it that this language, the Greek language, has an impact today? Weren't there other languages that had the possibility of being even more dominant? Why is it that this particular language that came from a very small part of the world, why was it that this language would move through history and come down and have impact on today? So I want to just present a little of that with you today and, and re refresh your memory if some of you would have an opportunity to look through this. Uh, for those of you who studied languages, you know that the Greek language developed, as all languages did, over quite a period of time. And when you look at Greece, there were a variety of dialects. Uh, it wasn't initially just a one monolithic dialect. Uh, they did come together over some time to come into what eventually became uh, two basic strands. I, I think we can agree both a, a kind of a classic strand and a kind of common strand often known as Koine. 
But Greek developed over time eventually to be uh, the language of the folk in the area of Greece. As it developed in its dialects, there were opportunities for Greece, the, the Greek language, to spread beyond just the boundaries of Greece in history. If you're a history student in Greece, you will know that perhaps even back in the 8th century BC, there were times when the Greeks were expanding. They were sending ships out. They were known as very fine seafarers. These ships were going out into different areas around the Mediterranean, even at that particular time, taking with them already a knowledge of Greek, a knowledge of whatever the language was, the Greek language at that point, culture and other aspects. So even early on, there were colonies being established. There was an establishment of some Greek settings in the world around the Mediterranean basin. That was as early as the 8th century B.C. Then when you get to the golden age of Greek history, there was another particular time when people were fascinated with what was happening in Greece, what was happening with the language, and that was more around the 5th century B.C., I think, Pericles, I believe is, this would be his particular time. My point here is to simply say there was a history by which the Greek islands and the Greek area that we would call the Greek mainland had an influence that was more widespread than just its local area. The possibilities of people knowing Greek language, Greek culture was pretty well widespread. So this was happening even before the days of Alexander the Great. So I'm going to move rather rapidly to that. For those of you who've been studying Greek history, you know that there was this particular time when Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, uh, finally came in, uh, conquered whole areas of the land, and he bought into the Greek culture, and his son almost became the epitome of what was going to be seen as Greek life. Uh, Alexander and his exploits are well known. With Alexander, what happened was that he then took Greek life every place he went. You will then be aware of the fact that as he did this, this process was known throughout the Mediterranean world and even points east as Hellenization. Uh, this is significant because the 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 languages of those people who were conquered did main, be maintained, but they also spread Greek language. It became a common language that was often used throughout all of those areas where Alexander conquered. And even after Alexander's death, his generals divided up much of the world, and their process of continuing Greek culture was maintained through the Greek language that was then spread. So from the time of Alexander the Great, in the 300s BC on down to a few centuries later, it was very, very uh, positive to see how the Greek language became very dominant in whole swaths of the world, not only in the Mediterranean basin, but in areas east moving over toward as far as India. So the Greek language, as it developed and was being used, and eventually primarily through the common language known as Koine, it was the common language by which many people communicated. This was not true of all other kinds of languages. So at this particular point, I think one thing that's going to be important for us to see, the efforts of Alexander the Great then spread the, the, the um, Greek language in ways that you might not have expected otherwise. His adventures, his conquests, meant that Greek was going to be a, a significant language for quite a time in the whole Mediterranean world. Now, when the Romans decided to enter the scene, you might want to assume that the Romans would have overwhelmed the Greeks, and then they would have imposed their language upon them. That would be an assumption. The conquering nation might wish to impose its language. But one fascinating thing about the Romans, uh, the Romans were quite uh, in awe of what they saw out of Greek life. 
uh, Greek language was part of that, but the Greek culture, Greek philosophy, uh, Greek religion, they, they took parts of, of Greek religion and just sort of baptized it again with Roman names. Uh, they were fascinated with the philosophers, the writers, and all of this was something that meant the Romans seemed to just simply appropriate what was in Greece. They liked it so much. They were recognizing the fact that Greek was so well known that is, the Koine Greek was so well known that they were going to have trouble overwhelming that in any case. The area that had been spread around the world, the area that knew Greek, was vast. And so even though the Romans spoke Latin, at this particular point, Greek was something that they assumed, they took in, they absorbed, and they made that a part of their life. And so just as the Romans conquered the ancient world, the Greek language is not dead. It is still being used because it is a language of culture and is a language that has been used by the Romans as well. It has been said by some that any learned Roman would know Latin and Greek. And that would be a note in, in that particular time in that world. But I wanted to move on to another aspect that fits into my own area a little bit better and that is the rise of Christianity. Uh, when Christianity came on the scene, a lot can be said about the fact that the world was in such a position that it could be spread rather rapidly because of the cultural setting. Uh, the peace of Rome meant that it was possibility for Christianity to be spread rapidly. Uh, the language was the, was the possibility, it was there to help spread the Christian faith. And indeed, that aspect of the story is one that I think is very, very important. For in the Christian era, most of you will be aware of the fact that the New Testament, save for a few phrases and words out of the Aramaic, the language of the New Testament is Greek. So those who became familiar with the Christian writings had to encounter them in Greek. I will pause just a second and back up and say there was also something else in the, as the Christian era unfolded that was rather important to note. There were Jews in the Middle East who liked Hebrew. Their sacred texts were in Hebrew. Most of the Old Testament is Hebrew, not all of it. Uh, there's some Egyptian words, there's some other language words you'll find in the Old Testament, but the predominant language in the Old Testament is Hebrew. But because of what had happened back in the 8th century B.C. with the spreading of the trade from Greece, there had been a great Greek center that had developed in Alexandria. You had Greek's language in the Middle East and all around the Mediterranean basin. And so as things unfolded, there were Jews who then spread around that basin and they realized they could not read their sacred text in Hebrew. And so the Old Testament Hebrew was translated into Greek. Many of you will know that that is known as the Septuagint. The Septuagint, there's a tradition that goes with that. It's based on the idea of 70, maybe 72. It was the idea that 70 scholars went in separate rooms. This is one tradition. I mean, we're not, there are several that connected with this. 70 scholars went into separate rooms, translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. They all came out, and their translations, all 70 of them, perfectly agreed, and that's came up with the Septuagint. Well, that's a tradition. I don't know that we want to follow that one very far. But what you have then is the Old Testament text of the Hebrews is now in Greek. So wherever the Jews are, they basically will understand the Greek Old Testament. The Christian world, as it unfolds, it has its New Testament writings are in Greek, and then whenever it makes reference to the Old Testament, it quotes from the Septuagint. The early Christian scholars did not quote from the Hebrew. They most often quoted from the Greek in the Septuagint. Thus, the Greek Old Testament and the Greek New Testament had the bearing of the development not only of Judaism as it expanded, but primarily with Christianity. As Christians began to write more and more writings, the church fathers, for example, of the late first century and going into the second century, all of these church fathers wrote in Greek. It's not until you get to the end of the second century that church leaders, Christian leaders, are writing in Latin. 
Um, one phrase that was often said, Latin was considered vulgar. Now that, we take that various ways. But uh, it was considered too, a little too common, uh, more that the context of being vulgar is that it is a bit common, but it just simply wasn't the spiritual language. And so there was a, 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 a disregard, I think, for Latin moving into the second century. Christian writings were going to be written in Greek. The New Testament is in Greek. The church fathers are writing in Greek. They're corresponding in Greek. And the Old Testament is in Greek. Now, I, I wanted to press that point with you because I think from a standpoint of history in, in the Western European history and even a lot degree to the Eastern history, what happens then when the Roman Empire begins to fall to pieces if you know your history, what is there to take up the gap? Uh, one example is going to be Leo the Great. Uh, Pope Leo. <clears throat> There's a lot of tradition that's picked up about him, but in the middle of the fifth century, when the Huns look like they're going to come in and take over Italy, Leo, not a Roman, but Leo, the Bishop of Rome, goes out, and in some kind of amazing event, as he meets with Attila, he convinces, according to church history, Attila that he needs to leave. But the whole point is, Leo is given credit for saving Rome when the Romans could not save Rome. You have after that a particular time where the Christian church then has greater power politically as well as spiritually. And many of you, as you studied history, you're well aware of that. As you move into the post-Roman era, what happens in then as the Christian church begins to dominate? I wanted to lead into the fact then that that means that a language that is going to be of importance in spreading ideas, church concepts, other kinds of principles, many times that will continue the use of Greek. As long as you have the Christian church having the, the advantage that it had, the political power that it was trying to take, in that particular context, the Christian writings, which are in Greek, are going to have a greater influence than some other languages. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, just before I move into another part of this, uh, there is an interesting little side note to this kind of development, and it is a side note that has some impact upon the way Greek influenced English. And it has to do with the setting in Britain. Uh, the Britons had been conquered by the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon language was not yet as developed as the Greek. So as the Anglo-Saxons had come to Britain, uh, they were still in the process of establishing their ways of writing their language. About 590 to 600 A.D., uh, Pope Gregory in Rome, an interesting story, heard about some individuals who were in Britain. In fact, the two young men, as I understand the story, were brought into him and they were fair-haired, blonde, and the whole bit like that. He misunderstood some particular things that particular day as he met those young men. Uh, they identified themselves as Angles, he assumed that that was angels. And so as he heard more about the interaction with them, uh, he determined that he would send a missionary to those folk in Britain. This was about 600 A.D. He sent a fellow named Augustine. Now, not Augustine in North Africa, St. Augustine or St. Augustine, but this is Augustine the missionary. He sent him then to Britain. When Augustine then got to Britain, to introduce more Roman Christianity there, he found that there already was an old British Christianity. There already was in place an old British Christianity, primarily on the western side of Britain and in Ireland. And now you know who that was probably connected to. On March of every year that we talk about this man, maybe not in religious terms, uh, he's talked about in some other kinds of terms. Uh, up in Champaign, it gets a little interesting at U of I on uh, St. Patrick's unofficial day. But St. Patrick, 
and others that were, had been involved with an old British brand of Christianity. They did not necessarily adhere to everything that Rome had taught. They had gone their own way. The monks acted differently. They went out as missionaries 12 by 12, but they also preserved texts. They had in their, at their access some of the great old texts. They were interested in the great old Greek classics. And so amazingly, what they had in store were old ancient texts. Many of them were biblical texts, but some of them were classical texts. Now where I'm going with this is that after Augustine the missionary came and they codified the religion there in Britain to be in adherence with Rome, you still had your emphasis upon the Greek language in knowing what church teachings and church doctrines were. It still is going to be spread throughout the British Isles, and that's going to be important because very soon in Northern Europe there will be uh, invaders who will come down into Southern Europe. The Germanic tribes will come, and one of the things that will be wasted away in their path will be many of the great libraries and the great storehouses of documents that were in the European continent. Where did Europe restore many of its ancient texts? It came from the missionaries who were sent out from the old British Christian center, largely in Ireland and in Scotland. They went around to the northern part of Europe, coming down and reintroducing to many people the great Greek classics, and the Greek texts from the, from the Bible. And so what we find here is that Greek has survived in many ways. It has had an influence far beyond what we would expect in those little islands in the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Uh, primarily, I think, because of what Rome did. Rome was more than willing to appropriate Greek language and Greek culture. But I think you've got to add to that what the Christian church did. As the Christian church spread and became dominant in all of Europe, even to the point of making sure that everyone felt it was dominant in all of Europe, the Christian texts are going to have an influence on religious life, but secular life as well. And I think that is why as history unfolds, we're going to see how important that is. Now I wanted to turn just a little bit to some areas uh, a little outside my field, but I wanted to share some of what I think would be important to know about the influence then upon Greek on our own English language. One scholar has identified at least 50,000 English words that are derived from Greek. Now that is one scholar's view. Another scholar has said, that 30% of all our vocabulary today is based on Greek. I do not know if that is true, but I'm just quoting one scholar. That's how you get out of these things. One scholar has said. So 30% of all our vocabulary is based on Greek. One Greek scholar made this statement. He said, according to the Webster International Dictionary, the total of the word stock of the English language is 166,000 words out of which 41,000 are Greek. Uh, that is one-fourth in his estimate. Uh, he goes ahead and says that the whole of medical terminology in English amounts to 43,000 words, out of which 20,000 are Greek. These figures, with it seems like some differentiation among them, these figures give us some idea of the great impact upon the language of Greek, even upon the way you and I speak and the way we communicate. Uh, it's even pointed out that the words used in the concepts of our thought and our expressions today come out of Greek origin. For those of you who are students, you will appreciate this. Analysis, synthesis, antithesis, method, Therapy, you need that after an antithesis, okay. Dogma, diagnosis, these are words in thought and concepts that come out of Greek background. But then words in medicine and science and education like mathematics, physics, astronomy, democracy, 
philosophy, athletics even, theater, and rhetoric, and words in the church, and Judaism, baptism. My background is Baptist, so you would understand we try to look at that word quite a bit. Evangelist or evangel, church itself, ecclesiastical, apostle, even the word monk, prophet, patriarch, hymn, and psalm. These are all some words that we have. Then even talking about the use of grammar, I found this particular statement as someone was talking about how the Greek has influenced the way we deal with grammar. His comment was that even the term grammar was devised from the Greeks. Uh, It means that which pertains to writing. Then the grammatical terms and concepts that you and I perhaps remember from our youth, article, noun, pronoun, adjective, verb, adverb, preposition, conjunction, and interjection all of which I remember from grade school. These are words that come out of a Greek background. So in this particular concept, these words, which have a Greek culture, a Greek heritage, a Greek background, all of these have a lively part of the discourse that we are involved with today. There were possibilities that many other languages could have had an impact in the ancient world. But Greek survived, and because of the interesting things that happened in history, it became a language that impacts the whole way that you and I communicate this day. Someone has made this comment, one of the fascinating things about the Greek language that allowed it to survive was that you could could work with its parts. You could have prepositions. You could add something, a prefix. You could add a suffix at the end of the word. Greek allowed much more than Latin ever did. Greek would allow for new words to be constructed, for you to put together different parts of the words. And in that creative possibility, Greek maintained a livelihood. And thus the Koine, the popular language, the the people's language, that could continue to develop and could continue to speak and could continue to be used. Uh, Let me make just a few other comments and then I wanted to open for any kind of discussion. One of the fascinating things for me is that in the history of the church, some of the biggest arguments we have ever gotten over are the meanings of Greek words. And so as if you ever did want to read in church history about why certain things were done the way they were, look again to see if there was a Greek word that had something to do with it. One example for many of you, if you are a part of the Christian community, you may go to a church where you say a creed on Sunday morning. Uh, One of the creeds that you may be familiar with is the Nicene Creed. So some churches use that on a Sunday-by-Sunday basis. If that is something familiar to you, you would know that around the year 325, after Constantine, the great emperor, had identified himself as a Christian, he decided to get involved in a great Christian controversy. And so he was going to try to resolve one of the issues that had come before the Christian church at that particular time. One of the issues was, what kind of substance is God? And so they argued over two words, homoousion and homoousion. Now, you've got to get your mouth straight to say that. Homoousion and homoousion. And they couldn't resolve it until some believe even the emperor himself said which word they were going to use. That's an interesting one. Another interesting thing has come in the church is the nature of Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. How should she be defined in history? We had another argument as we were trying to deal with that particular word. Is she the mother of God, Theotokos, or is she the mother of Christ, Christotokos? The church divided 
on that particular issue on how you would define Mary, the mother of Jesus. So in many of the cases, the controversies even that welled up in the life of the early Christian church, even those controversies went back in many cases to how you would use the Greek word and which Greek word you would use, and that then would tell you how you would deal with some of the issues that would come up. There are other wonderful words here. I, I won't uh, throw out these particular. I had some other Greek theological terms here, but I don't know that we really need to, to get into all of those. I think at this point what I'd like to do is just pause and see where you might like to have a little discussion and, and, and probe at those points where you're itching. Yes. Okay. Yes. So we thank our speaker for this part. I'm not sure if he has more to say, yes, but right. at least yes. for this uh, interval, if you have any questions, yes. uh, mm -hmm. this is your time. Okay. I have a question regarding yes. these two terms that you just mentioned yes. uh, that you have to. Uh, oh, use. homo. Yes. Can you give us a meaning of the difference between yeah, this and that? I thought somebody would do that. Um, it has to do, uh, they're very similar words. It talks about, are you of similar substance of or like substance? It wants to know the substance that is that of Christ. Are you of like substance or of similar substance? It has to do with substantia. And this is a different kind of word here. And it has to do with this, just a variation in meaning, like and similar. Yeah. And again, back to the English, like yeah. and similar are used interchangeably in yes. our days, but yeah. not that day. In that, no, not in that particular so day. like it, is different than similar. Exactly. Similar is very close. Uh, well, similar so it is not quite as much like. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very enlightening. Yes, yes, yes. Any, yes. Well, I guess just to sort of carry that thought a little further, so it wasn't the debate at Nicaea, and, and uh, now I don't want to get too historical here. I know that they were responding in part to Bishop Arius, but... Yes. But the idea that uh, uh, the ultimate decision at Nicaea was that uh, Christ and God and the Holy Spirit were of the same substance, yes. essentially. Yes. Uh, and Arius had said, no, Christ was the Son of God, and as the Son of God, he had, uh, he had uh, come after God. God had created yes. him, That's and exactly therefore, right. yes. there is a separation, yes. which is yes. denied by the, uh, uh, the homoousia yes. of That's the... Right. Uh, yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Uh, there was the, the point in that particular thing that uh, they were trying to resolve. Uh, Arius, who was a bishop, had uh, tried to say that Jesus was the son and therefore he was separate from. And they wanted, he wanted to press that. And many people thought that that was logical. But that did not go well, I think, with the bishops, especially around Constantinople. And that's where the, po the power was at that particular moment. Yes. The Bible was written uh, in, the, in the Greek language, yes. mostly in the New Testament. Yeah. Today, we all read. Yeah. Uh, the New Testament, yeah. All of the New Testament is in uh, different forms. There are some classical Greek uh, parts within it. Primarily, it's Koine Greek, which was the more popular language. There are Aramisms. Uh, Aramaic was the language that was spoken by the people of Palestine. It was a language that had come from Babylon when they were in captivity in the 5th century B.C. So they spoke Aramaic, but they wrote the New Testament in Greek. Primarily it was Koine, a common language of the people, with some classical phrases. Luke, Luke's gospel has some more classical Greek phrases. Uh, John, uh, we could talk about, John's gospel is addressed basically to a Greek culture. For many of you who have read the New Testament, the Christian New Testament, and you've read in John, you probably wondered what in the world is he after as he starts his gospel. It looks so different from every other thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you're thinking, what in the world is he doing here? It's obvious that, at least I think to, to biblical scholars, he is trying to address a Greek audience. He's trying to draw in the Greek audience, and there is a concept within Greek. Uh, we have talked about this a little before, the logos, theology, the word, and what that meant. And I think John was trying to appropriate a concept, a, a, a kind of a philosophical concept dealing with logos, and wanted to let the, 
the world, the Greek world, know, aha, you have this concept, Jesus the Christ, in his view, fits that understanding. So in the beginning, there was this powerful word, this logos, and this powerful word was with God, and lo and behold, folks, this word was God. So he appropriates Greek to speak to a Greek world. And uh, the Gospel of Matthew, as I understand, is the only one written in Hebrew. Um, it was not in Hebrew. Uh, originally, it was in Greek, but it is the one that speaks much more to the common people. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, today we have, uh, other than King James, we have different versions, mm -hmm. NIV and you name it. Yeah. I'm not sure if I lost the numbers. Yeah. Uh, these um, significantly big number of versions of the same original language, mm -hmm. each one says it's uh, translated from the original language. Yeah. Is this because of the richness, quote unquote, of the Greek language that this word could be this or this or this, or what? what is it? Yes, excellent question. Um, I like the idea, the Greek language is very colorful. It allows for great opportunities to, to interpret. The classic one we can look at is the word love. I love this, I love my dog, I love my wife, I love grits, um, you know, I love Mountain Dew in the afternoon, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, where do we go with the understanding of love? In Greek, there's four different words. So there are four different words in Greek just for love. And most of them you would know, especially three of them I think you're, you're more aware of. Philea, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So there is that. Uh, Philly means? Philly is, is brother. Brother, Yes, okay. so it, brotherly love. Uh, then you have eros, which is a kind of erotic love. We're familiar with that. Uh, from the Bible, if you've been involved with church, you're understanding with the word agape. And so there is that sense of a very high moral love, agape love. Uh, the fourth one that is not as well known is storge. And that is another word for love. The, the Greek language is very, very colorful. There, it allows for different kinds of ways to look at the language, and that sometimes is why, as, as we try to get that right English word to interpret that, you know, how do we do that? If you're going to, I love you, all right. Uh, we say that, English does it, but in Greek, it's, it's more colorful. I mean, you can really have some fun as you would talk about those particular words. And it plays out in, in the Gospels. If you read in the New Testament, uh, you know, there is that particular story, uh, if you're familiar with that, where Jesus comes and asks Peter, do you love me? Yes, he says, I love you. Then he comes back, do you love me? And then he comes back again, do you love me? The Greek notices by the gets to the third time he has shifted words. Or at, let's put it this way, the Greek writer shifted words, which makes it interesting for the, for the preacher and the theologian as you look at that, because even in the text there, the Greek notes a difference in the use of that word. Is the difference, just uh, following up on this, in even the reply of Peter when he said, do you agape me? He yes. said, I feel you, or something like yes, that. Yes, exactly. That's so exactly right. He started. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Now, if uh, you don't have other questions, I have another one. Yes. I'm a very visual person, yes. so I've heard you say the word koineia a few times. Koine, yes. Koine, yes. Okay. Uh, how do you spell that? It'll help me familiarize yes. myself with it. K-O-I-N-E. Sorry, and it would be very nice. K-O-I-N-E, koine. Uh, that just simply refers to the common language that was spoken, and it was developed. It, please don't, you can't uh, say that it, it, it was just set in stone and did not continue to develop. Koine Greek continued to develop as it met the needs of local peoples throughout the whole Mediterranean world. But the New Testament, the, la the primary language in the New Testament is Koine Greek. It is not classic Greek. Uh, however, as I said before, there are some parts of the New Testament that do have classic Greek phrases, primarily I'm thinking of in Luke. But that's what Koine is. Koine Greek. And if you study, if, if anyone is, if, let's say if you're going to a divinity school and you're going to say, I want to study New Testament Greek, you're going to study Koine. Yes. 
And the term cornea has anything to do with cornea or co there is another big word, cononia or something? Or uh, yes, it, uh, I, I can't come up with the exact background of that. You got me on but that there, one. There, there, there is, a, there is a, a root background to it. Okay, great. Yes. Hi, I'm Mashana. Yes. Um, I'm taking an ancient or history of ancient um, Christianity course. Yes. And we discuss when discussing the Council of Nicaea, we discuss how the East wasn't wasn't as acceptable to the um, basically to I'm sorry, I'm I'm trying to figure out the word. That's okay. Go ahead. Basically to what they produced. Okay. And did that have did that affect the way ancient Greek language or culture spread throughout the East, them not being so acceptable to the uh, Council of Nicaea decisions? Um, to some degree, um, you raise a very good point. Um, Greek was the language of the church for its first few centuries, but it remained the language of the Eastern church. A lot of us in Western culture do not appreciate, I think, as much what has happened in the life of the Eastern Church as you get to Greece and what we would call Asia Minor or Turkey and Palestine and those areas. That was a very strong point for the development of Christianity and the language there was Greek. Um, up until Nicaea, all of the major bishoprics save one were in the East. The only major bishopric was in Rome and some parts of church history, it was as if the Bishop of Rome was over by himself sort of waving a flag saying, all of you other bishops, remember, I'm over here. Um, the bishops in the East, primarily the Bishop of Alexandria and the Bishop of Antioch, Alexandria in Egypt, Antioch in Northern Palestine, those bishops had major influence. And a lot of the debates will go between Antioch and Alexandria if you're studying in church history. So I'm finally getting to your point. In that particular regard, I think Greek language and their understanding and how they saw things, they're going to spread that through their language. So Greek will be the dominant language of the Eastern Church and it will be the dominant language of the Eastern Empire, which will be known eventually as the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantine Empire will last until the mid-1400s when it is overcome by Islamic forces, when the finally Constantinople falls and the great Christian church there, the Hagia Sophia, the great Christian church, is overnight transformed from a Christian church into an Islamic mosque. In fact, if you even go back, if you go to Istanbul today, and you go to that church which is still standing, and you'll look at the very top area of it, you will still see Christian symbols in this church. It's an ancient, ancient church. So. Greek was the language of the Eastern Church, and it was the language of the Eastern Empire, and it obviously had more influence for a long period of time than the West. Uh, it took a while for the Bishop of Rome to let the rest of the church know that maybe they needed to give him the recognition that he liked. I hope if you come from a, a Roman tradition, you will not... Uh, Dis discount this, but it, it took a little bit of while, uh, though his claim was was pretty good, but he also had fellow bishops that he had to, to struggle with. So his claim in the Western world, Latin, uh, could not be quite as strong as the influence with the East, with Greek. Does that get a little bit of what you were asking? Okay, okay, good. Any other questions? Excellent question. The question is, uh, where did the term come from? It's all Greek to me. I don't know the full background to that, but um, I, I would hazard, and this is a, a, a careful thing, or not a very careful thing to do, I would hazard several things. Greek throughout much of history has been a language that a lot of people have known, especially those who are more learned. As I mentioned in Rome, those who were the leaders, the educated folk in Rome would know Latin and Greek. Um, so it was, it was well known, but it also, it was one you had to work on. I mean, not everyone knew the language. Um, 
it, it, it is very, very colorful, and as it spread, many people were aware of the fact they knew it was widespread, they knew it was well used, it had many implications, but there were also many people who did not know the Greek. So it's Greek to me. I mean, it's just, it's a language out there that is, is in the sphere of knowledge, but it's not one that I'm well appropriated with. That's the kind of guess I would hazard. Yes. 